Hello, my name is Nicolas Perrone, and I'm a research assistant professor at Universidad de Svesia in Chile. In this presentation, I will discuss my recent book, Investment Treaties and the Legal Imagination, How Foreign Investors Play by Their Own Rules. I will consider the relevance of the arguments not only to better understand the international investment regime, but also to reimagine the future of international investment law. The investment treaty regime, that is the treaties and investor state dispute settlement, is not short of contradictions. For some, it's a regime to promote and protect foreign investment. With flaws, nobody denies flaws, which can be improved. However, for many other, it represents yet another obstacle to green energy transformation, to solve economic crises, to deal with the global pandemic, or to protect human rights. Given these contradictions, the disagreements surrounding this international regime are not surprising. In my recent book, I argue that the problem lies at the core of the investment treaty regime. Today, we call international investment law a set of legal principles and rules that international bankers, lawyers, and business leaders crafted in the post-World War II. On the slides, you can see some crucial names and organizations. This project was a European initiative promoting, among others, by the German banker Hermann Abs and all firms such as Royal Dutch Shell, but with important transatlantic support from organizations such as the American Bar Association and companies like Standard Oil of New Jersey. Archival evidence shows that these individuals and their professional associations were concerned about decolonization as much as state economic intervention in their own countries. Their main objective was making a legal regime that, they, that could discipline public interventions in the economy. With this goal in mind, they not only promoted investment treaties and ISDS, they also imagined a legal canon, an interpretation that is remarkably similar to present ISDS practice. Through their networks, discussion, and initiatives, these bankers and lawyers occupy the space of international investment law for their project, the project of global banks and oil and mining companies. Here, you can see pictures of some important events for those who promote investment treaties and ISDS. An important one was the International Industrial and Development Conference held every four years in San Francisco. Apps presented his Magna Carta there in 1957. 12 years later, in 1969, Harley Shawcross complained that Global South countries, quote unquote, clinched to exaggerated stories of capitalist exploitation. Another opportunity to meet were the events of the International Chamber of Commerce. We see here a picture of the 1963 meeting held in Cologne, Germany. The International Association for the Promotion and Protection of Foreign Investment was located in the more international Geneva, gathering bankers, multinational corporate executives, and lawyers from Europe and the United States, including the large oil companies, Royal Dutch Shell, Standard Oil of New Jersey, today ExxonMobil, and Compagnie Française de Petrole, today Total. A relevant question for today is what, is what this past means for the way we think about the investment treaty regime and its potential reform. I would like to make five points. The first is that the premise that arbitrators can interpret investment treaties in unpredictable ways risks removing the international regime from its historical and political origin. The lawyers and bankers who defend the investment treaties and NSDS talk about indirect expropriation, due process, due process, and legitimate expectations using a language that is remarkably similar to current ISDS patterns of interpretation. We can see, for instance, in we can see this, for instance, in the debates at the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, the predecessor of the OECD. In the 1960s, ISDS was defended as a means to create a new case law on foreign investment, a case law appropriate for the emerging international economy. This point was explicitly made, among others, by the American Bar Association, as we can see on the slides. Today, the application of these principles may vary from case to case, but there is little discussion that they, are, that they apply to ISDS litigation. A lesson to be learned is that while treaty text does matter, there's no question about it, certain ideas have gained importance through the process of discussing and proposing how foreign investment should be governed. In the meantime also, 
other ideas and issues have been silenced. The bankers and lawyers in question openly criticize government's intervention in the economy, notably development aid and transfer of technology. The second point I want to make is that those who favor investment treaties and ISDS in the post-World War II were firms operating in the natural resource sector, especially oil, as just said. Herman Abs, the German banker who championed the idea of investment treaties, was himself closely linked to the oil and petrochemical industry before and after World War II. After the war, among others, he was a director of Deutsche Shell. On the slide, we can see the thinking of the US and European lawyers who promoted investment treaties and ISDS on this specific question. For the global South, this situation is significant. These early promoters of investment treaties observed that global South countries should not focus on their industrialization. That was not urgent. They should stand, instead tap on their natural resources to find their means. Foreign investors, they claim, should join forces with national elites to make this possible. The present political economy of natural resource extraction is also remarkably similar to that proposed by the promoters of investment treaties. Economies in the global south that depend on natural resource exports are organized through an alliance between foreign investors and national elites. These alliances, quite often, are in tension with local communities and the environment. My third point refers to foreign investors' obligations. In the post-World War II, the investment treaty regime was imagined as a solution to enforce foreign investor rights against states without exhausting local remedies. Some accepted that other human rights could be enforced against states too, but if states wanted to enforce their rights, they were expected to rely on contracts, not treaties. In the 1970s, when the political environment was less favorable to multinational corporations, those who defended investment treaties were ready to make some compromise. The best example is the 1972 Foreign Investment Guidelines of the International Chamber of Commerce. They were drafted by a team led by John Blair, a Royal Dutch Shell consult consultant who had contributed to drafting the ICSID Convention. These guidelines incorporated foreign investors and states' rights and obligations. But as observers noted at the time, foreign investor rights were clear and precise, while corporate obligations were broad and vague. States were also asked to sign investment treaties and ISDS as part of the deal. For the OECD Development Assistance Committee, the 1972 ICC guidelines lacked political imagination. Yet this view was not shared by the Business and Industry Advisory Committee at the OECD, or by those who spoke in favor of the guidelines at the time, notably Gerrit Abraham Wagner, president of Shell, and Emilio Pochado, vice president of Exxon. This way of thinking of foreign investor obligations, again, is remarkably similar to current international practice. The fourth point I want to make is that to facilitate foreign investment, those who promoted investment treaties in the 1950s and 60s were expected to, ally, to forge alliances with national elites. These alliances were necessary to legitimize the, pro, the projects they noted and would, beneficial for, and would be beneficial for them and for the national elites. Charles Ryan and Herman Abs were some of those who made this point explicitly. In the meantime, however, there was a growing opinion that the extraction of natural resources could not be, could not be guided by a private or a state imperative only. The human rights of, commun of the communities living near the projects were at risk. With some limitations, different UN General Assembly resolution and UN reports gradually recognized this situation in the 1960s and 1970s. The UN group of eminent persons warned about this problem in 1974, noting that joint ventures, quote unquote, may confer some benefits on a small elite group of nationals. The investment treaty regime never reacted to address this issue, however. These regimes, principles, and rules evolve along the lines imagined by the founding fathers. Essentially, investment projects only concern foreign investors and states. The investment, the investment side is treated as a sort of terra nullius. There is state sovereignty to grant concessions or licenses, but otherwise, there is nobody there. In ISDS arbitrations, local communities have no legal standing. They can only file amicus curiae submissions. 
Lastly, I would like to draw some lessons for the future. The first is that those who promoted investment treaties argue for some principles and rules that were directly or indirectly opposed to the dominant thinking in international law at the time. The need to exhaust local remedies and the protection of legitimate expectations are two relevant examples. Similarly, I think, Reform and investment treaty regime cannot shy away from what it is required to reimagine this regime. We need to conceive new and different ways to govern foreign investment, which for some may go against the present canon. The second point is that the text of investment treaties was and remains far from anything clear and precise. There's always space for interpretation. Those who drafted the first model treaties acknowledge this problem and discuss how these treaties were expected to be interpreted. To be meaningful, any treaty reform needs to be preceded and accompanied by discussion of new principles and how we expect these principles to be interpreted and apply in actual cases. This debate is as important as any treaty drafting itself. The last point is that those who promoted investment treaties and ISDS made specific issues in this debate. Some notorious examples are local communities, transfer funds, development aid, performance requirements, and corporate misconduct. These and other topics are fundamental to recenter international investment law as a sustainable development field. To conclude, I think states have an obligation to reclaim the space of international law for themselves, for the communities. In addition to protecting foreign investors, this international law field needs to share, help states to maximize the benefits of foreign investment, while also minimizing costs and risks. This should be the main purpose of international investment law. Thank you very much for your attention.